Stage two is the I-140, or Petition for Alien Worker. Uh, there are three legal issues with the, I, with the I-140 petition. Number one, did the beneficiary, so the sponsored beneficiary, meet all of the job requirements for the position prior to the date that the application for the perm was filed? Okay. So did the beneficiary meet the job requirements as of the date that the labor started the perm was filed with the Department of Labor? Issue number two, did the sponsoring company have the financial means to pay the offered salary um, that has been determined as appropriate for this particular job at the time that the application for the perm or the labor certification was filed. So both of those have a determination date as of the date that the perm application or the labor certification was filed. And the, the final issue is into which, which preference category uh, does the job fall? Now this is very important because those that are going through the process have probably also considered whether or not they fall uh, under the EB3 or the EB2 classification. And it's very, very important. EB stands for employment-based. Um, so an EB3 is an employment-based third preference category. The EB2 is an employment-based second preference classification. Okay. Now, although the EB2 and the EB3 determination is made at the second stage, the I-140, we have uh, laid the groundwork when we wrote the job description uh, when preparing the labor certification. So these must all be considered, including the financial ability of the company to pay, during that three-hour period, that three-hour conversation. Okay. Now, the, let's talk about the, the EB2s and the EB3s. Uh, those are the uh, preference categories. Again, EB2 is second preference, EB3 is third preference. Now what I mean by the preference categories is, or where that's important is, there is a limit on the number of green cards that can be issued every year. And because there are more applications that are received every year than, are, um, than can be approved, there basically is a backlog. I, I, I picture like the, the narrow part of a, an hourglass. You've got a lot of applications that are filed and received every, every year, but you've got a limit on the number of visas that can be issued. Uh, not only is there a uh, per, an annual limit to the number of visas, there is also a per country limit. And that uh, country determination is, focuses on the country of birth. So a person who is, uh, was born in a country where there's a backlog, uh, which means right now, uh, India or mainland China, PRC, for the EB2s, uh, they cannot simply apply for and get citizenship in Canada or England or any other country uh, because it, it goes by country of birth. Now, interestingly, um, if the primary beneficiary uh, is from a country where it's backlogged, but he or she has a spouse who was born in a country where there is no backlog, we're actually, actually uh, permitted to use the country of birth of the spouse. Okay. So there's a, a general numerical limit every year. There's also a per country limit. Uh, and there's also a limit uh, per job classification or preference category. And again, this is where the EB2s and the EB3s and the EB4s comes into play, uh, especially based on the per country classification. Okay. Uh, the preference classifications can be very, very important. And what I suggest you do is just do a Google search for a visa bulletin. The State Department uh, issues every month their um, what they call priority dates, or they issue the visa bulletin that includes the priority dates based on the preference category. Uh, the <clears throat> preference classifications, uh, they include the definition, and the, the way that relates to the priority dates and country of birth is that 
because of the number of applications that are filed every year and the limit on the uh, number of visas that can be issued every, according to the preference category and to the country, uh, what we do is we look at the person's filing date of their application for the PERM. That is called the priority date. Now, some people will not need a PERM application, in which case they file the I-140 directly, and that becomes their priority date. So what you do is you take the person's priority date, you look to see what category, what preference category they fall into, are the EB-2s or EB-3s, and then you look at the per country limit to see whether or not uh, there is an exceptionally uh, backlog period for persons born in those countries. And again, the, the EB-2s are current. There's no backlog for anyone except for people who are born in uh, India and mainland China. Okay. Now, the definition of the, the EB-3. The EB-3 includes those people who have a bachelor's degree and the job requires a bachelor's degree uh, and it also includes those, the skilled positions, which uh, include those people who have at least two years of experience. So the EB-3 is for bachelor's degree and skilled positions. Now the EB-2, the level above, is uh, a position that requires a graduate degree, which is typically a master's degree or above. The individual must meet that requirement also, so the beneficiary must qualify and the job itself must require a person to have at least a master's degree. If those two requirements are met, then the person may fall under the EB-2 category. And again, the importance of that uh, is that for most countries, or frankly all countries except for India and China, uh, there is no backlog or waiting line for the EB-2 or the master's degree or above level. Um, okay, so the preference dates are important, the uh, priority dates are important, preference categories are important, and the country of birth all have to be considered for the uh, determination or calculation of when the person will be able to apply for the green card, which is the final stage or the adjustment uh, of status or the I-485. Okay. Now, Earlier I had mentioned that the, uh, the person must show for the I-140 that they met all of the job requirements uh, as of the date that the PERM application was filed. Same for the financial ability of the sponsoring company to pay the offered salary. It is as of the date that the PERM application was filed. However, Despite the fact that the, I, that the Department of the, the Immigration Service and the I-140 look at, at the date that the perm was filed, the Department of Labor has a totally different rule. The Department of Labor requires the individual to have all of the qualifications or meet all the job requirements prior to the date he or she first started working for the company. So an individual who has been working for the company two or three or four years is very proud of the fact that they have worked for the same company, that they're now being sponsored. They're happy that the company is willing to uh, sponsor them for their green card now. And they say, well, I, I have an advantage because I've been such a loyal employee all these years. Actually, that does not help them. It is better for you, for the person to file as soon as possible because the write up in the listing of what the job requirements are may not list any degree, skill, qualification, training, whatever uh, that the person acquired after the date they started working for the company. Again, the I-140, they just have to show that they had the qualification prior to the date the perm was filed. But we don't even get to that stage if the Department of Labor does not issue the perm application and the Department of Labor is going to evaluate whether or not the person met all job requirements prior to actually starting with the sponsoring company. 